Well, if you were here last week, uh, you'll recall that we pause, uh, we're pausing briefly in our series on the book of Psalms, and we're going through the letter of Second John. And I found it to be a wonderful, uh, encouraging letter from John on the prominence that truth should have in our lives, and how we need to protect it, and how we need to be on guard against false truth, to be on guard against deceivers who would bring a, fa- a false account of the gospel. And last week we introduced the book of Second John and looked at just the first three verses where we saw John writing this letter to these believers with authority, writing as the elder. And he conveys his love for them, which he expresses in the context of truth, in the context of the gospel, in love and truth. And John has a love for these believers because of the truth that Christ loved him first. And so then he can then reflect that love towards them. But he's not the the only one. But in fact, all believers who know the truth are able to reflect the agape love of God towards one another because of that gospel truth. The truth that is in them and in which they are abiding in and will be with them forever. A beautiful context of truth in which love is given and received. And in this context of truth... To those who are, have the truth abiding in them, John then extends those blessings of grace, mercy, and peace. Blessings from God the Father and blessings from Jesus Christ the Father's Son. Grace, mercy, and peace come from them in a divine and powerful way and are shown towards us who are in the truth. They are shown to us in truth and in love as only God can give. And it's such an amazing way to kick off a letter, especially as today we're going to see how John continues on with further exhortations to these believers. We'll be focusing today on verses 4 through 6, where John hits on several aspects for them to both believe the truth and act on the truth. He wants them to know now that their belief in the truth is not expressed by simply knowing it, uh, but in loving obedience and action upon it. So let's turn to 2 John again. You can find it right between 1 John and 3 John. And uh, again, we will read the book in its entirety. 2 John, starting in verse 1. It says, The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father, and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Such a one is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch yourselves, so that you may not lose what we have worked for, but may win a full reward. Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. This is the word of the Lord. So after his introduction and greeting to these believers and his declaration of grace, mercy, and peace for them who are walking in the truth, John begins to get to the point of his writing, which he opens with thanksgiving, with rejoicing. I rejoiced greatly to find some of your children walking in truth, he says. I don't know how John knew. Maybe he had visited them and seen them. Or maybe someone had visited him and told him about how the saints in this church were walking in truth. But John's response here isn't just, oh, that's nice, or attaboy, good for you. No, he's what? He's rejoicing greatly. And he wants them to know it. 
It brings great joy and excitement, a gladness to his heart, knowing that these Christians are walking in the truth. We should do the same, right? When we see fellow believers walking in the truth. I'm encouraged when I see Arlene walking in the truth. I'm encouraged when I see Taylor walking in the truth. It brings joy, right? Those of us who are parents, if we're walking in the truth, it brings great joy when, by God's grace, we see our children walking in the truth. Let them know how you are encouraged by them. And that's what John's doing here. He's letting them know that their faithful walking in truth is an encouragement and a joy to him. Now, unfortunately, though, as we see referenced here by John, it's only partially true of this church. He says, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in truth. Not all your children, meaning not all the saints, just some of them. He was rejoicing greatly over those who were walking in truth. And so his rejoicing, his joy is really in part because that means that some of these saints were not walking in truth. Now, as we introduced last week, we know that truth is a major theme of John. It comes out in all of his letters, but this passage especially. Five times, uh, truth is referenced just in the first four verses of Second John. That's significant. And as last week we explored what it means to love in truth, right? Love in the context of truth. And so we need to ask, what does it actually mean to be children walking in truth? And what exactly is the distinction between a saint who is walking in truth and a saint who isn't walking in the truth? On any given Sunday morning, both might be hearing the truth, sitting under the teaching of the Word of God, being reminded of the gospel, and hearing truth in song and in prayer. And there's not really a visual distinction between these two, unless you're in a a legalistic church. In that case, the ones who are walking in truth all have their shirts nicely tucked in. Their children only speak when spoken to. They show up to all the church potlucks with something homemade to eat. There's definitely a, a visual distinction there. But for you and I, how do we evaluate which group we fall into? Are we children walking in truth, or are we walking according to something else? And as I've prepared for this message, my prayer has been, you know, God, am I a children or am I a child who is walking in the truth? Are there other truths that I've accepted and followed after? Are there areas of my heart where I've adhered to a truth that comes from a source other than him. There's an opportunity here for prayerful examination of our own hearts when it comes to the truth. So what does it mean to be walking in the truth? The ESV uses the term walking in truth, but if you have another version, it might say following the truth or living by the truth. It's not a literal one step in front of the other walking, but it does seem to give the picture of truth being like a path. And so walking in truth or following the truth is both knowing the truth and adhering to the truth. It's living it out and sticking to the path of truth. It's an outward manifestation and action stemming from the truth that we know and the truth which lives in us. And as we saw last week, this letter was written to those that John loves in truth because of the truth that abides in us and will be with us forever. And for us to be walking in the truth, we must first have the truth abiding in us. We must know the truth. This is our creed, our confession, the gospel which we proclaim to be true, which we know and believe, the truth which we see revealed in scriptures, God's word, the revelation of God himself who is the source of all truth and who cannot lie. Do you know this truth? Does this truth abide in you? Are you searching the scriptures to know more and more the truth? Are we like Timothy, who Paul admonished in 2 Timothy 2.15? He said, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly dividing or rightly handling the word of truth. Do we know the truth in a way that we are rightly handling the word of truth, able to discern truth from error? There's only one truth, but there are many errors being promoted and celebrated in our culture and day. 
You can walk into many churches, sadly, on a Sunday morning, and you can hear entire sermons which amount to nothing more than motivational speaking. Where is the gospel? Where is the truth being boldly proclaimed? And in many cases, it's the errors that are boldly proclaimed and celebrated, and the truth is pushed aside as outdated or old-fashioned, culturally insensitive, or held to no longer be true for our modern worldview. But if it's not truth forever, then it's not true. And we need to know what is true. And we can't live out the truth if we don't know the truth. But likewise, and this is, this is where it gets hard, honestly, we can't just know the truth. We have to live it. We have to live the truth. It's where the rubber meets the road, brothers and sisters. If we read our Bibles every day, if we go to church every Sunday, We can quote verses on every topic, but we don't consistently act on it, then we're not walking in the truth. And John is making a point that not all the Christians he's writing to, not all Christians he's writing to who know the truth are acting on it consistently. Think about it. If you know the truth of John 8.36, where Jesus said, So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed, but yet you act as if you're still a slave to sin constantly repenting and bemoaning your addiction? Are you walking in truth? If you've read 1 Thessalonians 5, where Paul gives the commands to rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. But then you go about constantly complaining and moaning, and you're not praying. Are you walking in the truth? Colossians 4, 6 tells us, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to you ought to answer each person. But then you're always quick with a cutting word. Or you can go on and on about how great a movie is, but the main dialogue is bleepity bleep bleep, but yet you highly recommend it. Are you walking in the truth? If you believe Cautions, chapter 1, where we see that Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. If you believe that, but then you get rocked when some little local presidential election comes up, And your party's candidate doesn't get elected. Or as we were faced yesterday with, if your candidate were to be eliminated. Or if you're convinced that your candidate is the only one that can obtain uh, or maintain peace and prosperity. And instead of trusting the sovereign God of this universe, you place all your hope and trust on the election outcome. What does that say about how you are walking in the truth? Knowing the truth and walking in the truth are different. We must know the truth in order to walk in the truth. And our walking in the truth is evidence of the truth that abides in us. As James says in uh, James chapter 2, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, Without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith, by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. James isn't saying that we're saved by our works. And our works aren't to be performed as an obligatory function, just to do them as a legalistic practice. Our works are evidence of our faith, of the truth that is in us, the outworking of that truth. Because living the truth, walking in the truth, It's not about the actions themselves. Why do we walk in the truth? Why is it important to act on what we know to be true? Because as we see here, because we're commanded by the Father. Because it's His commands we're obeying. The truth comes from Him, the source of all truth. Think about that for a second. God, the Almighty, Infinite Father, Maker of heaven and earth, the eternal Holy God who is the source of all truth, He has revealed the truth to us. He has given us the truth in the form of Scripture, has given us Christ, who we know to be the truth. It all comes from Him. 
And he doesn't give it to us in the same way that we would get a company memo. You know, like, FYI, there's donuts in the break room this Friday till noon. Right? That's a memo. The truths of God hold weight, and they're effective for all. It's less like the memo, and it's more like the company policy. Its governing authority is supreme and applicable to all. The truths that come from God aren't nice-to-have options. They don't come as mere suggestions, as practical advice, or as general etiquette. They come from God the Father, and as such, they come as commands, as imperatives. What we know to be true, we are commanded to adhere to. And therefore, not following the truth, not walking in the truth, isn't just a dismissal, dismissal of the memo, you know, and I, don't, I don't feel like a donut today. No. It equates to disobedience of the Father's commands. His commands are not ours to choose which ones we want to follow. If we know them to be true, then our responsibility is to follow them. And this isn't just the, the Ten Commandments, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself, don't kill, don't steal. Yes, those are commands, and yes and amen, we should adhere to them. But as we read and study and learn the truth of all Scripture, then we should embrace walking in that truth. Incline, incline your heart to the truth. Walking in truth is a response of the heart towards the truth that we have received from the Father. When we read in the Psalms, praise the Lord, then praise the Lord, church. Give him praise. Give him glory. Lift up your voices and shout his praise. When we read in Romans twelve thirteen, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality, then let's do it. Give to a brother or sister in need. Look for opportunities to open your home to others and welcome them. There's no guidance on how big their needs must be before you give to them. There's no guidance on what the minimum square footage must be to welcome someone to your kitchen table. You have crackers in the pantry. You have a couch to sit on. Send out the invite, right? His truth, the truth of the Father, is imperative. There's an accountability in knowing the truth because there is then the expectation of walking in that truth. It was the same for Israel. God God revealed himself to Israel specially in a way that he didn't reveal himself to the other nations. He gave them truth the Ten Commandments, and many others. He gave them the law. But with that truth came an expectation of adherence and judgment for when it was not. In Amos 3.2, God says to Israel, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. He's saying, because I have revealed myself to you, given you truth, taught you what is right and pleasing, Therefore, when you sin, because you knew what was right, I will punish that sin. The same expectation is there for us who know the truth to walk in the truth. We have to remember our motivation is not fear of judgment. We walk in the truth because we love the Father who first loved us and freely gave us his Son. And so as Jesus said in John fourteen fifteen, right, if you love me, obey me. That's loving obedience here. We walk in the truth because that is the example that we have from our Savior. He lived his entire life according to the truth, walking in it every day. It's why Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. He is our example. We walk in the truth because out of love, we desire to please our Father. We're no longer strangers to God. We've been adopted as sons and daughters of the Father, children of God. And so we desire to please our Father. And we walk in truth because, brothers and sisters, the truth is in us. It abides in us and will remain with us. And to walk in truth is to walk in a consistent manner with what we know and believe and in which we are commanded to walk. Not out of legalistic adherence to laws, not in following them just for appearance's sake, um, but as a matter of the heart, because the truth is in our hearts. And the God we serve is truth. He only speaks the truth. He has revealed the truth of the gospel to us. And so there is a response that should emanate from our hearts in accordance with that truth. 
And so those who know the truth should walk in truth. But the command to walk in truth, that's not the only command that John wants the church to follow per this letter, is it? There's another command that we see here in verses 5 and 6. 2 John 5 and 6. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new commandment, but the one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. If we believe the truth and are walking in the truth, then there are four actions which should accompany that belief, four actions we should have. Have love for one another. Have love for the truth. Have belief in the truth. And have action on the truth. Let's start with that first one. Have love for one another. Now we said there is another command, but this one isn't being commanded, is it? It's being asked. John says, I ask you, dear lady, speaking to the church, I ask you to follow the command which we've had from the beginning, that we love one another. Notice he's including himself in this, that we love one another. This wasn't being given from a place of aloof authority, and he's not asking them to do something which he himself is exempt from. This ask is based on a command which has been from the beginning and applies to all believers, new Christians, seasoned Christians, young, old, women, children, elders, deacons, missionaries, Bible studies, leaders, uh, parents, Love one another. Now, what does he mean when he says it's been since the beginning? The beginning of what? The beginning of their faith. From the moment they came to Christ and entered into the body of Christ, from that moment, they were now connected to the entirety, the entire body of Christ. Some being a hand, some being a foot, being joined together in the body of Christ, there is a love that we are to have for the other members of the body. And John is reminding them that we need to follow the command we have. We are to show love to one another. John was there when Jesus gave this command to love one another to his disciples, wasn't he? Back in John 13, uh, 34 and 35, Jesus told his disciples, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus lays it out here in plain terms, doesn't he? Love one another like I have loved you. Stop and think about that for a second. How has Jesus loved you? To what extent has Jesus loved you? His love for you is sacrificial, the greatest sacrifice. His love is patient and unending. It doesn't get fed up with you or give up on you. His love is filled with compassion and care for you. His love never fails. It's not argumentative. It's not resentful. So that being said, Jesus is now saying to his his disciples here and to us, love one another as I have loved you. Show my love to one another. Look at my love that I have for you. And now reflect that same love to each and every member of the household of God. And by this, everyone around you will know that you are mine. They will recognize Christ in us because his love is shown from us. Maybe you think this was more for the disciples that, you know, they were expected to love one another. Maybe you think that John being the apostle of love was just, hyper fixated on this theme of love no when something is repeated in scripture it's what it's because it's important for us right and this command that we have to love one another is repeated often i'll go through these quickly but the you can get the references in the sermon notes online john 15:12 this is my commandment that you love one another as i have loved you john 15:17 these things i command you so that you will love one another Romans 13, 8, Owe to no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves has, fulfilling, has fulfilled the law. 1 Peter 1, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. 
1 Peter 4, 8, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. 1 John 3, 11, for this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. 1 John 4, 7, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. 1 John 4, 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Are you seeing the pattern here? John isn't writing them something new here at all. They already have this command. He says, I ask you, dear church, follow the command to love one another, which has already been given over and over. Why? Because we're prone not to. Because it can be hard. Some of us are easier to love than others. Some of us are a little stubborn, a little selfish, a little careless in our words or actions to one another. So what are we to do? Look to Christ. Look at the love he has for us. Reflect on the love he has shown to us. Be eternally grateful for the sacrificial love that you and I have been shown and then show that same love to your brother, to your sister in Christ. It's not a new command. It's from the beginning of our faith. And the example of Christ's love that we have, it's not, a, it's not a passive love, is it? It's not shown by him staying in heaven, just kind of looking down in a loving gaze towards us. No. His love is in action. It's shown. It's not passive. And it's how our love is to be. And so when John reminds these believers to love one another, it's a reminder. Not just to passively love your brothers and sisters in Christ, but to show them love, to take action through love. John writes in 1 John 3.23, And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. So we have the command to love one another. And on the flip side, though, we are to have a love for his commands. That's what John says here in 2 John, verse 6. And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. What is love? Living the truth. Embracing the truth. Walking according to the truth. According to the commands that we have in God's word. John gives this wonderful reciprocal viewpoint here. From the first lens, there is a command to love one another. And from the second lens, love the commands. Love the truth. Delight in the truth. You know, when I think of someone who loved the truth, the first person that comes to mind is David. David delighted in God's commands, his precepts, his laws, his commandments. He extolled them in the Psalms. He desired them. If you think back to uh, to early on in our series in Psalms, when we looked at Psalm 19, You'll recall what David wrote about the sweetness of God's commandments. Psalm 19, verses 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than they than are I'm sorry, than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. And moreover by them your servant is war, warned, in keeping them there is great reward. David desired God's commands. He saw them as pure and right and more desirable than gold or riches, sweeter than honey to the taste. He delighted in the truth. He loved the truth. The truth here we see in Psalms is perfect. It's sure. It revives the soul. It makes wise the simple, brings joy to the heart. It enlightens the eyes. Anyone see a downside here of the truth? No. And in keeping the truth, it says there is great reward. This is an absolutely profound view and declaration of the truth. But is this our view of the truth? Are the commands of the Lord a burden to you, legalistically trying to execute each one, or are they a delight? 
Is there a love that we have for the truth which brings joy and freedom that comes from walking in the truth daily? When we're at school or at work, do, we see, do others see us living out the truth, standing up for the truth because of our love for it, walking it out for others to see? This is love, brothers and sisters, that we walk according to his commandments. Walk them. Live them. Have a love and a desire for the commands of the Lord, for the truth. These commands aren't new. We've heard them from the beginning, middle of verse 6 here. The truth of God's word. We heard and believed the truth. And so now we are to hold on to that belief. Next week, we'll get into the following verses here, starting in verse 7, where John is warning these believers about those who would deceive them with new teaching, those who would bring new commands, which don't confess the truth that we hold to, that, which gives some other false teaching other, um, other than what the truth is of Christ. But those are not the commands, the truth, which these believers heard in the beginning. They didn't come to Christ through a false gospel. Their eyes were opened when they heard and received the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And having come to know the truth in the beginning, it's now imperative that they adhere to and cling to the truth until the end. These truths are from the beginning, and they will be true until the end. It's why the psalmist in Psalm 119 can declare, Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for they are the joy of my heart. I incline my ear to perform your statues forever to the end. The truth is our heritage forever, since the beginning. And believing the truth brings joy to the heart. But we must also act on the truth. Verse 112 there it says, I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. And John here echoes that very same thing. Just as you have heard from the beginning so that you should walk in it. We who have heard the truth and believe the truth must also walk in the truth. As we saw in verse 4, that's not a given though. John wrote that he only saw some walking in the truth. But here now, John is providing a meaningful progression of love and truth and action. He says, follow the command to love. Love the commands of God. Believe the truth which you've heard from the beginning and walk in the truth you believe. He says, act out what you believe. Walk in it. Live it. Incline your heart to perform God's statutes forever to the end. If you believe the truth, walk in it. Walk in it when it's easy. When your job is going well and the kids are obedient and the finances are coming in with abundance. When it's easy to praise the Lord but also walk in it when it's hard, when things aren't going right, when there's sickness, unsteadiness, disruption in life. Remember that Paul's admonition to rejoice always came when he was chained to a guard in a Roman jail. He was preaching, teaching, writing, and encouraging, even when it was hard, and so should we. Believe the truth which you've heard from the beginning and walk in the truth which you believe in. John gives us no option here to keep these two separated. They are linked together as one. And in studying this passage, I found great uh, conviction when prayerfully I reflect on, am I acting on the truth? Am I acting out what, it, what I know to be true? Is my life characterized by loving obedience to the truth? I was so encouraged on this, uh, this past Thursday with our time serving with Freeway. If you want to know what it looks like to lovingly take action and serve others as the hand and feet of Jesus, if you want the opportunity to show compassion and love towards the lost, the needy, the brokenhearted, to pray for those in need and to have an opportunity to love those who have never seen or felt the love of Jesus, Sign up for the next opportunity to serve alongside Freeway Ministries. You'll see it in action there. For some of us, taking action in this way might be challenging, might be uncomfortable. But we who know the truth are also to walk 
out that truth. And that's the main point here. Our belief of the truth is not expressed by simply knowing it, but through loving obedience and action upon it. It's what John is asking the church to walk in. It's what we've been commanded to do since the beginning. And it's the example that we have to follow from Christ. He knew the truth because he is the truth. And he acted out the truth in loving obedience to his Father. Not just by knowing the truth, and not just by teaching it as theoretical or as knowledge, but by acting on the truth perfectly in every moment. And now we who know the truth and have the truth in us, having been shown his great love, having this command since the beginning to love one another, we now take action on our faith through loving obedience, showing love to one another, walking in truth until he comes, that our lives would bring him the honor and the glory that he fully deserves.